Hey guys, this is Sabina. Welcome back to Day to Day Chess. For today, I had a video prepared, but I changed it in the last moment, given the depart of International Master Emory Tate a little bit too early from us. He was an international master, African-American, one of the best African-American chess players out there. Um, he was playing a tournament these days in the Bay Area and uh, he seems to have had a heart attack and uh, passed away soon after that. Um, it's um, a sad day for some people who knew him. I personally didn't know him, but I definitely appreciate um, a good chess player and somebody who's uh, giving his, uh, his life for, for different causes. So um, it's sad to see somebody um, go away quite young and um, simply um, without you know, uh, being old or having some, some kind of, uh, difficulty. So, um, anyways, I hope you guys, um, are praying for him. So, um, um, in his memory, I've decided to go over his beautiful win against, uh, Grandmaster Leonid Yudasin, originally from, um, Israel, but who has been living in the United States. This game is an older game, but it definitely shows a great spirit and a great attacking game by Emory Tate. Uh, let's enjoy it together. He started by e4, c5, knight f3, d6. So we have the Sicilian. Black is trying to play the Scheveningen, but we have here the Stozin attack with bishop c4. The idea of this move with white is that the bishop is going to be doing some damage on this diagonal. Um, for example, I, I mean, of course, we're putting pressure in f7, but there are always typical sacrifices in this Sicilian. Once black plays e6, and if they are going to develop their bishop in b7, there will be sacrifices in e6 that definitely, uh, for those players who play the Sicilian, I am sure... Um, you are already familiar with. For those who are not um, playing the Sicilian, uh, it's definitely an idea that uh, you need to pay attention to and you need to bring it into your um, repertoire at some point, I think. it's if you're Especially if you're a dynamic player and you like attacking Sicilian. With either colors, it's a um, great way of attacking. Okay, so here we have bishop b3. Bishop b3 is a nice um, prophylactic move because black is going to play b5 anyway, so we want to make sure when that happens there won't be a b5 with tempo and then a b4 with another tempo, possibly losing our e4 pawn. So that's why white plays bishop b3 in this type of positions. So against b5 he can choose what he wants to do about the e4 pawn. Because after b5, like I said, b4 is the threat. And here Yudasin went for knight b d7, a development move. b5 is uh, something played a little bit more often these days uh, with the idea of course b4 and why normally castles here because for example in case of a b4 we're playing knight a4 and capturing this pawn is not the best choice for black because I already have three pieces developed and I have the castle as well so technically four pieces you only have one knight um, going for some pawn and you've created some weaknesses on the queen side. All of your other pieces are right in the, at the starting position. So now simply I can play, for example, rook to e1, chasing your knight away. Then I can play bishop g5. So white is almost finished with his development. He has a pawn down, but it doesn't matter that much because I'm going um, to create lots of damage with your king in the center. So just keep that in mind. Don't go for pawns unless you are uh, pretty sure that um, you're going to be able to save your king from any mates or anything. <clears throat> so uh, Yudasin went knight b to d7 and here queen e2. Just a simple development move protecting the e4 pawn. And as you notice, 
Emory Tate is giving his pawn in f2 for the possibility of at some point playing f4 maybe, or simply he wants to keep it in f2, maybe he wants to play some g4 attacks, and he doesn't want the f3 to weaken this diagonal. Those are some problems that white sometimes have uh, has in the Sicilian. Now knight c5, bringing extra pressure, but we're fine, we just defended the e4 pawn. Now, don't be worried about your bishop in b3. If you lose it, you lose it, it's fine. Um, let him lose another move to capture your bishop. Meanwhile, just go for the attack. Or at least, that was um, Emory Tate's style. G4 here, a very nice um, continuation for white. B5, of course, when uh, somebody attack starts attacking on one side, you, you want to make, make sure you're attacking on the other one, doing something, or else you will get mated. And of course, white continues in his uh, Velimir Me Velimirovich um, attack spirit. Velimirovich system in the Sozin. Um, G5, attacking the knight. Of course, we have to go knight d7. And now, a very nice move, and the typical idea with uh, from having the queen in e2 on the same file as black's king. So yes, with the queen in e2, we defend the e4 pawn, but in the same time, we create this kind of long um, pin here that's going to be used as a typical um, idea in the Sicilians, either putting a bishop in d5 or a knight in d5. And the trick is, well, it looks like we're giving away a piece. In fact, we are giving away a piece, but with the queen e2, we will, after capture, pawn captures, we will have um, an outpost here in c6 where our knight will go and then cr uh, create, uh, well, first attack the queen, but also attack the e7 piece, which will be, you know, placed on e7 when e takes d5. Uh, if black, for example, would play bishop e7, we just have knight c6, double attack, and black would be losing. So Emory Tate plays in the spirit of the Sicilian bishop d5. Very nice move here by white and bishop b7 was played. I don't know if Udasin was scared or not, but he is going for his development. He doesn't uh, trust capturing the bishop. In fact, this um, this has been played uh, later on, and uh, somebody went for knight to c6, attacking the queen. So now just making sure you cannot stay with the queen to control the e7 square. Now queen b6, e takes d5, knight e5. Because, of course, you guys see that bishop e7 would just fail to uh, continue the game after queen takes e7 mate. And uh, basically, uh, after knight e5, this was played in a game between uh, Brian Smith and Justin Sarkar. So, uh, definitely a game to check. The game ended up in a draw, but if you're playing this line, you need to make sure you have analysis on what you're going to do after sacrificing the piece. Let's uh, go on with the game, bishop e7. Now, of course, uh, we take. And why do we take? Well, because this knight in c5 was active. So by taking, we make this knight retreat on a war square in b7. Do that in your own games. If you are about to make a, uh, a trade, think of it that way. Okay, I want to make this trade. Is the trade going to be in my favor? If I trade there, how? What am I doing? Am I helping myself or am I helping the opponent? Or maybe you don't help yourself that much, but maybe you definitely put your opponent in some more situation. And this is what happens here. After capture, maybe why didn't do that great of a thing because the bishop uh, in d5 was an active piece, possibly could sacrifice in e6, but by t taking in b7 is just making this knight go more passive. So that was a great idea from white side. Here we've got a4. So he doesn't just focus on the king side, now he goes on the queen side because black is not super well developed, so now we can just open up the position we're threatening to, to win a pawn in b5. Black has to do something about this pawn. b4 is a possibility, um, but here we can simply continue with our knight d5. Continue our amazing idea because if you take, we've got this knight c6 and then he takes d5. 
So you already are familiar with that idea. Uh, instead of b4, you just you went for b takes a4. And rook takes a4, of course. Don't worry about your king in the center. Uh, the position is not super open in the center, so the king is safe here for the moment. How is black going to develop? Definitely not castle long because, well, there's no pawns in front of the king. a6 would be falling instantaneously. And uh, castle short, where I already played g4, g5. Doesn't that sound an alarm? Anyway, so um, black is improving the position of his knight with tempo. Rook a3. Check this out. The rook in a3 is going to come at some point on the other side of the board. Um, sometimes we see beginners playing moves like this, but in fact, you know, we play it ourselves as well. And, um, you know, there's there's a strong uh, mind in every, every chess player. So, um, you know, just uh, let's embrace every single every single move and idea anybody does and see how we can use it to our own benefit. Queen b6 and here castle short. Yeah, uh, castle short because there's nothing to worry about with the cheap pawn. Black doesn't have the white color bishop to annoy in that diagonal. My king can go to h1 and I I can just chill. There's nothing to worry about. Bishop e7, king h1. And now black kind of has to castle eventually. I mean, the king cannot stay in the center. I'll start some f4, f5, opening up the position. So you need to bring your king kind of to some safety. And here comes start coming the attack b4 chasing the knight away now don't even think of taking him before okay there's knight c6 losing a piece immediately uh knight e4 oh what you're giving me a knight not you are actually attacking the knight in d4 but here um emory tate came with an intermediate move very nice one knight f5 take that you want to take this knight? Well, take it in f5 if you want to. Allow me to play knight d5. That's exactly what happened. Now, knight d5, double attack. You have to go back to d8. Now, I take in f5. He didn't even hurry taking this knight because now I'm attacking this bishop in e7. I prefer to take that uh, bishop, make you go king h8 and be on mate, then maybe some queen h5, queen h7, rook h3 mate. That would be something nice. Now, queen h5, he's still going to attack. Threatening rook h3 and mate. Definitely a good choice to keep the rook in a3. Knight a to b6. Trying to change my pieces. Don't worry. Rook h3 first. Intermediate move. A very good one. Now knight f8. Of course, defending h7. Oh, okay. Now it's time to continue the attack. f6. f6. Trying to open up the g-file for my other rook to come into play as well. You want to take this knight? Go ahead, take it. I'm going to take in, G in G7, then I take your knight, and there is going to be mate on the h file. So that's exactly uh, how the game went. Now king takes G7, bishop b2 check. The last piece, is bringing the last piece into the game with bishop b2. Now king G8, what to do? G6, you have to open up. I mean, black is defended with that knight in F8, but that's not going to that's not gonna be enough. Bishop f6, g takes f7, check, king h8, oh wait, I have three pieces in attack, something is missing though, right, this rook in f1, let's bring it into play, threatening a very beautiful mate in, in uh, g8, instead of this, maybe he could have played queen g4, and uh, the game could have finished a little bit earlier, because now we're threatening mate, and if you just move the knight, now rook g1 and threaten the mate, but rook g1 is just as great. Threatening the mate, rook e1, the last defense of black, but he has to give away some material back. Rook takes e1, now bishop takes b2. And maybe black thought, oh, okay, here I'm safe, I have how many pieces for the rook? Three, I can save this position, but no, rook e8. You cannot save it, your king is desperately alone there. My pawn is about to get promoted. Knight f6, rook takes d8. I have a queen up and I'm about to checkmate you. Queen h4, very good move. Now rook g3. This pawn in f7 is just winning the game. And now queen g5 and there's going to be mate g7 or g8. I hope you enjoyed this game. Uh, my sincere condolences to the family and gensu nasumus. Let's be there for everybody. Have fun playing chess.